On um, Thursday of this past week, our country recognized Veterans Day, and we like to do that here at Cedar Hill Baptist Church as well. And so uh, I'm going to recognize you all collectively this morning. And so if you are a veteran, um, if you have have or are serving in uh, the military of the United States, we'd ask you to stand at this time. We'd like to recognize you this morning. I know there's a number of you. Uh, all at one time here. Okay, all right, I was going to say. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. All right, thank you. You may be seated. We just wanted to recognize you and thank you today and uh, uh, how much the, it means to us that you all served in the way that you have through the years uh, in defense of our country. Thank you very much. We have another special at this time. I believe Sandy Gutterson is going to come and sing for us at this time. Sandy?
All right. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Brother Braden. Yes, come and uh, play for us this morning. Psalm 100, uh, a psalm that uh, gives us some real definition, some real defining information on how to come before God. Um, we're talking about gratitude. We're talking about being thankful and thanksgiving over these next couple of weeks here. And so today's emphasis is to uh, bathe our prayers in gratitude, to cover our prayers in gratitude, to make sure that thanksgiving and praise and gratitude are a central part of our prayer life. And our prayer life is such a unique opportunity we have, and it's something I've taught on and love to teach or preach on, but to have the opportunity to come before the throne of the Almighty, 
to have full access to his throne and to come to be able to get a hold of God. What an amazing uh, gift and privilege that that is. But then how do we do it and what do we say? And I've, I've done a number of things uh, through the years where we've talked about uh, building our prayer life and growing our prayer life. Uh, we did some things a couple years ago, especially I think summer a year or two ago, where we, we talked and emphasized uh, spending an hour a day in prayer with God, which uh, I think at first seems like a lot, you know, an, an hour. What am I going to talk about for an hour? We have um, um, the opportunity as a church. I mentioned this in the announcements last week, but as a church, um, we've had the opportunity through the years to go to a local hospital. It's a specialized hospital in Mechanicsburg where people, uh, everybody in there, every resident in that hospital has a, has a trach. And so most of them can't talk. And so that means that as we go, as our team goes, as different volunteers from our church have gone and visited with the people at that hospital, um, you have to carry the conversation. You have to go in and be able to talk to them and share with them. And uh, you may not get a lot of response back. And sometimes your response is just a, a blinking of the eye or holding your hand or squeezing your hand. You don't always have a lot, obviously, of conversation there. And so that can be intimidating. It can be intimidating to go in and try to carry the conversation. Uh, I, I don't, you know, most of you uh, who have known me for years know that I am um, uh, by and large, I'm naturally a very quiet person. You know, I like to have the other person carry the conversation. Uh, I kind of sit in the back seat. That doesn't always go with my job anymore. Uh, obviously, that's not the nature of what I do here at church. But uh, it's kind of my, my natural go-to. My natural default is to sit and let someone else talk. I'm not, I don't think I'm a great conversationalist. I, I think we feel that way sometimes when we get into our prayer life, too. And, and we... It's time to pray, and whether we are praying quietly in our hearts, in a devotional sense, just me and God, or whether we're praying in a, in a classroom setting, we're praying as a teacher, we're praying in prayer meeting, we're praying in front of others, I, I think we all go, oh, what do I say? <laughs> uh, what, what am I going to say? And we, we think about it, and we, we write down a couple things, and we have a couple prayer requests, and we pray, and it takes like three or four minutes, and we feel like we're out of things to say in our prayer life. I think that's not uncommon. I think as we grow in our spiritual life and in our walk with the Lord, that, that grows too, and that starts to develop. But a big part of, 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 our, of our time with the Lord, and I think we see this in the model prayer, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. John, John the Baptist, he taught his disciples to pray. Lord, t teach us to pray. We want to pray like you pray. So Jesus gives them what we call the, the Lord's Prayer, a model prayer. And it's very short. To read through it only takes seconds, right? It doesn't take very long to read through. It's very short. But it gives us a good outline. And, and in that outline is a lot of praise, glorifying God, and thanking him. There's some request in there, but I, I think we have a tendency in our prayer life to overemphasize the request and underutilize the thanksgiving, the praise, and the glorifying God. And so um, my challenge today as we're talking about gratitude is to work that thanksgiving, that praise, that glorifying God into our prayer life. To make that a, a central part, if not the biggest part, of the time that we spend in prayer. That we're thanking him and showing the gratitude that we should towards him. Psalm 100, we've, uh, I've used the phrase, it kind of gives a protocol of prayer. How do we pray? How do we come before God? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. And listen, come before his presence with Singing, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. That solidifies who we are and who God is. Now verse 4 gives us another protocol there. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. How do we pray? How do we start to pray? What are the things we talk about in our conversation with God? Psalm 100 talks a lot about singing, 
praising, thanking, blessing. Asking isn't even one of the, uh, one of the steps in this particular psalm. It is in others. We can certainly go to the Lord. He's our Heavenly Father. He wants to know what's on our heart. We have not, the Bible says, because we ask not. And so we are commanded to ask, no doubt about it. I just think we would all agree. I think we would all agree. We tend to overemphasize the asking and underemphasize the thinking. And that's our human nature, right? That's the way we are. We will pray about something for years and thank him for it once. <laughs> you know, oh, Lord, answer that prayer. Thank you, Lord. And then we move on. Uh, well, to, to, to make that thanksgiving and that praise of who he is and that blessing him for what he has done and for what he is doing and for what he will do, to make that a central part of our prayer life. That's my, that's my goal this morning. I want to give a couple examples. We're going to look at a couple passages here. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Go a little farther back here in the Old Testament. The book of Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to read a verse for you. I'll give you a little bit of background. But in Daniel chapter number 2, as you turn there, Daniel 2 verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It was a dream that troubled him. So in verse number two, he called in all of his um, chief uh, magicians and all, all the king's men that would be his advisors and the wise men of the, of the council. And the problem was in verse number four and five, the king said, I had this horrific dream. I am troubled today because of the dream. I need to know the meaning of the dream. And so the wise counselor said, all right, tell us what the dream is. We'll tell you what it means. And the king said, here's the thing. I can't remember the dream. Right? I, I'm troubled by it. Have you ever been there? I, I've had that. I mean, small, you know, small ways. But I woke up. I'm like, oh, troubled because of what I just dreamed. I'm like, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Must not have been that bad. But it troubled me. And the, the king is distraught by this. The king is distraught. I had a dream that so troubled me. I'm asking you to help me, he says, but I don't even know what it is. And so the magicians and the wise men are like, oh, we can't really help you if you don't tell us what it is. And the king basically says, then what good are you? Right? And he threatens them with their lives. I'm going to get rid of you all. Because, you know, this is, you know, the king is, we know Nebuchadnezzar. He has a problem throughout his life here with pride and arrogance. Right? He'll be sent out to live like a beast in the field later on. So he has a problem with that. And basically the king says, you know, what am I paying you for? You know, if you can't help me, you, I have no use for you. He's, he's very blunt with them. And that's going to include all the new guys. The new guys who aren't even in the room. The new guys who are just being trained. New guys like Daniel. He's just been brought in. He's a young man in this situation. He's not even in the room when this happens. And so Daniel finds out. And Daniel makes a petition, let me pray about it and see if God, the one and only true God, will help me. And God, of course, reveals to him not only the meaning of the dream, but the dream to begin with. Gives him the dream, tells him what it means. It's very important that as we'll see these dreams as they develop and, and the, the history of it as it develops throughout the book of Daniel and into prophecy itself. So Daniel prays about it and Daniel gets an answer. That brings us to verse 23, where in the midst of Daniel praying and receiving his answer, he says, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So in verse 24, he goes in and talks to the king, and he's promoted. He becomes second in command in the empire of Babylon because of his wisdom, godly wisdom that he has given. But what does he do there in verse 23? He spends time thanking the Lord. Now, I don't want to minimize that. Uh, this is, and we see this a number of times in, in, in scripture, but here's one of those situations where Daniel 
and his, his cohorts, his co-workers, his other, other people in his group, their lives are at stake. The king is angry. He's impatient. And he's going to literally do away with them. We, this, is, this is not unusual. Uh, later under a different king, Daniel himself will end up in a lion's den, right? So this seems to be the way that they operate at this time. We know that. And so Daniel could have hurried this. He's like, Lord, I need an answer real quick here. Hurry up. Give me an answer. I'm running in to tell the king. But, but we see Daniel take the time to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being who you are, for giving us this answer. Thank you. He, he praises God for who he is and the work that he's doing and the things that are happening. We see that. I just pulled one verse out, but we see that over and over in Daniel's life. As Daniel serves under at least three, history tells us, maybe there's four different kings in there in, in his lifespan, as Daniel's lifespan. Daniel serves under all of them. And Daniel has, has the opportunity to be a witness and uh, uh, his prayer life. Look, it's his prayer life that gets him in the lion's den. Isn't that interesting? I hadn't really thought about that until I just said that. But in the chapter number two, it's his prayer life that saves his life. And by the end of the, end of the middle of the book here, it's his prayer life that almost exterminates his life because he's still praying the way he always prayed. Uh, things have changed even in Daniel's lifetime. And he's working through that. Psalm 118. I'm, I know I'm going backwards here. We were just in Psalms. But Psalm 118, verse number one. And there's so many of these in the book of Psalms, but I picked out one that I thought was familiar to us, that we, again, that we use a lot in the Thanksgiving season. Psalm 118, verse 1, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Uh, with that in mind, let's go right over to Ephesians. I'm jumping to the New Testament real quick. Ephesians chapter 5. And then we'll, then we'll stay put for a little bit here. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus and reminds them of this. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, prayer encompassed in thanksgiving and praise. To come before him with that praise. I th when we see the pictures of heaven, specifically in Revelation chapter 4, 5, when, when, when the, the doors of heaven are opened, the windows of heaven, I think is, is the proper word there, are open. And John is basically allowed to see in. He's given a vision of it. He kind of has a, an open window, open portal there to what's going on in heaven. And as he's witnessing what's going on in heaven, I think we see over and over and over again the praise before the throne, right? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The thanksgiving, the praise, the offering, the glorifying the throne is constantly happening in heaven. I, I wonder if that's not a better indication for us when Jesus said in that model prayer, in the Lord's prayer, Lord, thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's happening in heaven? What's his will in heaven? What's being, what's being done in heaven that's not being done on earth? There's a lot of things. But the picture we see there in the book of Revelation is constant praise and thanksgiving and honoring the throne of God. That gives us a, a good indication of where we should be, where our prayer life should be, where we should start from, the foundation of where we should begin. Thanking him for what he has done, for what he is doing, for what he continues to do in our lives. I think we have a tendency, I talked about this just a little bit last week, but we have a tendency to, to center on the material things, right? On the material things he's given us, but just to thank God, listen, for who he is. We see often, and we're going to get to some of these in some of the verses as time permits, but 
to thank God for about his attributes. The psalmist did that in Psalm 118, thanking him for his tender mercies, loving kindness. He's from everlasting to everlasting. Let's thank God for who he is, not just for what he's done for me, not just for what he's given me, but a perspective of thanking him for who he is, for what he does, for what he's working on, for, what, for his word and the promises therein that I can claim to be able to thank our Heavenly Father. Um, Thanksgiving, I wrote down, Thanksgiving alters our perspective, right? It changes our perspective. When we're grateful, when we cultivate, as we put on the screen there, cultivate a heart of gratitude, it begins to change my perspective because I can center on the woe is me, right? I, I, I think we have a tendency to do that. Uh, I can center on the things that um, uh, are, are wrong and overlook all the things that are right. I can center on the things that are a problem and not focus on those things where God has blessed me in innumerable ways. So it changes the perspective of where we're at. And we tend to do that, right? We tend to focus on on how bad things are. I, I, I've, uh, I had a lady at our church years ago. Uh, she only came to our church for, for a few months. But um, uh, this was uh, someone who had the perspective that everything that bad that happened only happened to her. You know. And it was, um, I mean, she would call me, Pastor, I'm having a horrific day. I'm like, all right, you know, let's pray about it. What's, you know, well, the, the Verizon guy told me he'd be here from 8 to 11, and he's not here yet. I'm like, well, welcome to everybody, you know? They know if, if, the, if what time the Verizon guy gets here is going to determine whether or not you have a good day. Anyway, I'm not picking on Verizon. They're all that way, right? But I, I, that's not going to determine whether or not you have a good or horrific day. It shouldn't be. That's, is that what I mean, right? I think it's an exaggeration of the point, but we tend to focus on the negative. We tend to focus on the bad thing. I, mean, I, I, I think this more and more, especially, I guess, as I get older, but I had a, an, an ambulance go by our house last night. And one of my first thoughts is, I'm, I'm just so grateful it's not coming for me, you know? I know it's a small thing, but I've never, I've never ridden in an ambulance. I'm, maybe I will sometime in my life, but I never have. Thank goodness. And I immediately know that I'm having a better day than they are, right? I have no idea what they're coming for or what's going on or what's happening or who it's about, but I'm grateful that I have the health that I have today. I might have an ache or a pain, but thank goodness I'm, I'm vertical. You know? I'm walking around. I'm able to do things. Are we, it changes our perspective, a heart of gratitude. It will do that in our prayer life. So that our prayer life doesn't become, Lord, this is awful, and Lord, this is terrible, and Lord, you have to fix this, and Lord. And there, there are problems in our life we're to take to him. But if that becomes the emphasis, we have things out of balance. It alters my priorities. It alters my priorities. A heart of gratitude and thanksgiving not only alters my perspective, but it alters my priorities. What are the things that are most important? What are the things I really need to be focused on? What are the things the Lord's trying to teach me and doing in my life? And I, I, I need to get my priorities back in line sometimes. I tend to get them out of whack. And then I wrote, Thanksgiving, a heart of gratitude, will ultimately bring us joy. Right? I think we see that. Even, uh, there's even a lot of uh, uh, secular surveys and, and, and things done today by uh, psychiatrists and, and so forth telling you, boy, people who are grateful and thankful are ultimately what? Happier. They're happy, you know, because they're thankful. And, that, and, and I guess, does it seem like it seems to me that maybe we're, we're in our culture today shying away from that more than ever, right? In other words, people seem irritable, grumpy, short-tempered, Everything's, everything's a problem. You know, I had some lady mad at me on the way to church here today, you know, on, on, on the highway. I, I guess I 
I pulled over to pass someone that was going slower. I'm only going 65 in a 55. Heaven forbid, you know, because they're going 80, you know, and they fly up behind me and her hands are waving and she's yelling out the window. I'm like, give me a second and I'll be out of your way, you know, one second. But are we, are we, do we not see that in our society a lot, right? Where people are just short-tempered and, and quick, quick to attack or quick to go after or quick to complain. and Boy, to, to be grateful and to be thankful changes our perspective, changes our priorities, and ultimately brings us joy. Let's look at another verse real quick. Philippians 4, 6. Philippians 4, 6. This one kind of sums up the whole thing here. Philippians 4, 6. Paul writes to the church at Philippi, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So there's the verse that encapsulates, I think, the, the, the different parts, the different facets of our prayer life. Are we to bring our request before God? Yes. How? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. That should be part of it. Not just, you know, I, 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 I use this casually, but I think we do this. I, I, I think we treat prayer and God sometimes like a great spiritual ATM machine, right? We punch in the right code, what we want comes out, you know? And so we say the right thing, or we, 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 we say the right, the right things, and God will give us what we want. Prayer life is so much more than an ATM machine, right? Are we bathing that prayer in thanksgiving? Are we gr so grateful for what God has done and for the things he continues to do in our lives? John 11 I know I have a lot of verses. I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch here too, but John 11. John 11, we have the story of um, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And in John chapter 11, I'm, I, wanna, I think I want to pick up in verse 39. John 11, 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He's been dead for four days. So Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shalt see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. It's interesting. The first things that Jesus said in this particular prayer was thank you. Thank you for hearing. This is before the dead rose. This is before Lazarus came forth. Lord, I thank you that you heard me. I just, again, going back to what I said earlier in the message this morning, uh, you know, to try to cultivate a prayer life, to spend more time with the Lord in prayer. And we, we come with maybe a few notes or a few requests on our prayer sheet or in our prayer diary or whatever we have. Maybe we take the prayer bulletin from church and we're looking over some things and we're not sure what all to pray for. And boy, it's an interesting. Jesus started his prayer by thanking God that God hears, that he hears and answers prayer. That sounds so elementary, but we, we miss some of the basic tenets in our prayer life to help to grow that. Now, I wonder why our prayer life is I think we would agree, most of us would agree, our pro probably our prayer life is not where it should be, not where it ought to be, right? Not where it will be. It sounds like the quote Brother Lennington made this morning on uh, John Newton. Uh, not, you know, not, not who I used to be, not who I will be. Uh, but listen, our prayer life needs to grow to the point, that, and we would all agree, it's not where it should be. You know, it's not... It's not where I want it to be. I know that I'm with the Lord, so it's, it's, it's going to be totally different then, so it's not where it's going to be. But Lord, I, I need it to grow. And if we need our prayer life to grow, I think to add in those tenets of thankfulness and gratitude, thanking God for who he is, for what he has done, not just for me, bigger than me, we see that throughout the, the, the prayers in the Old Testament, that the, 
the saints would go back to what God did for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What he did for the nation of Israel as, as Daniel, we talked about Daniel a little bit, but in chapter 9, Daniel has such a powerful prayer there for his people. And he, he, he goes back through all the things that God did for his nation, the prophets, what he promised, the covenants that were made, the fulfillment of those. I, I'm just pointing out some tenets this morning if we talk about how do I spend more time in prayer? There's, there's a lot to cover. There's a lot to cover if we start with thanksgiving. We start with praise. We start with glorifying him. There's so much to add to that. I think next week, um, well, one of the things I want to look, I think this is what we're going to do next week. Uh, we were not able to have communion the first Sunday of the month. Uh, our elements were not here. We get all that prepackaged stuff now. So I'm guessing it was on some cargo ship. So, no, no, I don't know where it was. I don't think it comes from China. I don't think so. I don't know. But anyway, it finally showed up. We had ordered it, but it hadn't gotten here. And anyway, we got our elements this week. They showed up, and so we have our, our, our stuff where we can have communion. And so um, I, was, I said to Kelly, because she plays during the communion stuff, uh, we couldn't do it beginning of, of the month. And she said, well, why don't we do it for Thanksgiving? And I think that's a great idea. Let's do that next week. Let's do it next week for our Thanksgiving service, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. But listen, in the midst of that, I'm going to highlight this next week, but we'll talk about it this week. Uh, when Jesus took the bread and he took the cup, what did he do? He thanked God for it. He thanked God for the bread. He was the bread, right? This was a picture of him. He was the bread. He was about to sacrifice his own life and shed his own blood, but he thanked God for the bread and he thanked God for the cup before they partook. So just a reminder for us all next week, as we gather together, we'll have our regular service next week, but we'll have in the midst of that communion as well. And boy, communion, I, I say it all the time, and it is, it's a time of remembrance, but that remembrance should be in gratitude, right? In thanksgiving, in gratitude. He paid a price we cannot pay, we could not pay. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. I hope as we come into this Thanksgiving time, we remember that Thanksgiving and gratitude and gratefulness to, to God. And today's emphasis was to have that as a central part of our prayer life as we talk to him. So let's pray. Our dear, gracious, and heavenly Father, Lord, as we come now to the conclusion of our service this morning, Lord, we've had an opportunity this morning to talk about gratitude and thanksgiving, and in particular, in our prayer life. So, Lord, we do thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for the, you, you as the creator of the universe. And yet, Lord, you loved me, and you cared about mankind, and you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary to save man. Lord, you've made that available to all all. Any who come before you and, and, and call on you as Savior. Lord, what a blessing that is that we can claim that promise, that free gift of salvation. Lord, I hope and pray as a pastor this morning here at Cedar Hill Baptist Church that if there's one here today that has come through our doors that does not know you as Savior, Lord, that becomes, that becomes step one. Lord, we're not going to be grateful for all that you've done until we accept it, until we believe it until we've taken it to heart and understand it. Lord, when we understand the price that you paid for our salvation, Lord, there can be nothing but gratitude as a response to that. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I pray that as we go through this season, this Thanksgiving season, Lord, we are, we should be thankful for the things that have happened and the things that we have and the things that are done, the family that we're with and all those different things. Those are good. But Lord, to take that just a step farther, to be thankful to the Almighty for that which you have poured out, the blessings you have poured out upon us. Lord, for who you are, for what you are doing, for what you will do in the days ahead. Lord, we thank you. 
For we ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Let's stand as we sing our last song today. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Number 380 in your book. The words are on the screen. Let's sing together. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you guide our steps as we leave from here today. Lord, may we be a lighthouse and a witness and a testimony to those that we come across today. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen.